From the news team at LinkedIn, this is Hello Monday, our show about the changing nature of work and how that work is changing us. Today's guest, Vincent Fuller, never thought he'd play pro football forever. No one does that. An athlete, even the best athlete, gets older and slower. And Vincent was good, like better than everyone from his high school and his college, but he never thought he was the very best. His first year, he played with a guy who was the number one draft pick. I saw his talent level in comparison to mine, and I said, okay, I'm nowhere close. So even if I get the opportunity to play on a professional level, it won't be forever. That was 2006. Vincent played with the Tennessee Titans for five years. It was a dream come true, but that's not what this episode is about. In his mid-20s, Vincent had to figure out a next act, a new field that would give him purpose and income. Now, there are many types of careers that are short-term, kind of like football. Either your ability to succeed changes or your desire to do the thing changes. Vincent anticipated this. So he planned ahead, and he also followed his curiosities as they arose. Today, he's a lawyer. He works as an associate at the law firm Freed Frank. He loves it. Today, he'll explain to us what football and law have in common. He'll share what was important to him as he chose his second career. And he'll go into how he prepared for law school, having not really done anything legal in his background. Here's Vincent. When I was a very young kid, the first thing I can actually remember is is having a San Francisco 49ers football uniform and and think that I was going to be Joe Montana. So just like every four or five, I don't know if every four, but me as a four or five year old wants to do is like, I'm going to be a professional sports player. Um, And then as you mature and you go older, um, you start realizing that there's there's other things and being a professional sports athlete is is hard to do. It's very difficult to make it. So I think, um, you know, right around middle school and early high school, it was like, you know, I want to go to college and see what I'm interested in, see if I find anything that motivates me and that I can excel at and potentially pursue that. Then once I got to college, it really started to look and look into the potential of being a professional athlete because I was successful in high school, but you're only competing in high school in sort of a local level. You're not really competing on a national landscape. And yeah. um, once I got to college and we started competing against the LSUs of the world and the UVAs and the Syracuses and the University of Miami's, and I felt like I was holding my own, then I said, okay, this is something uh, that I could actually do and and this being being a professional athlete and um and, and excel at. So when you're a young student and you're in college and you realize you actually have a shot at doing this, are you thinking at that point in your life, that it won't be a forever thing, that you're going to start playing professionally and also you will end playing and need to be prepared for something else? Or is that just not on your radar when you're 21 years old? So it was on my radar. And I think a a big reason for that is because you realize how talented other players on your team are in comparison to you. And like, okay, for for example, you know, when you come in as a freshman, my freshman year, I played with a gentleman by the name of Mike Vick, who ended up being the number one NFL draft pick. I saw his talent level in comparison to mine, and I said, okay, I'm nowhere close. So even if I get the opportunity to play on a professional level, it won't be forever. And it's likely, it's not unfathomable, but it's likely that I won't make the millions and millions of dollars that some of these first rounders do. So I'll have to be able to do something when I finish my NFL career and where else to prepare for that than, you know, as a college freshman, sophomore, junior, et cetera. So you already had enough self-awareness at that point in your life to think, well, I better study football and football and something I, else. I, uh, I was a full time student <laughs> during my <laughs> during my college career, um, finished with two undergrad majors and had the opportunity to, you know, of course, play in the NFL. But, yes, that was something that was um, particularly important. And I, you have to give credit to your parents as well, uh, to my parents for making sure that I continue to focus on school, even though my athletic career was sort of taken off. And Vincent, I feel like I need to just interject here that you are the oldest of four brothers, all of whom are playing or have played in the NFL, right? That is correct. Um, and you are the one who told them that they should study as well, right? That is that is also correct. Um, and, and fortunately for them, uh, most of them were much more talented than I in football. Um, So, you know, even if they they did study, which they did in school, they have played a longer or probably will play longer than I in the NFL. But they did a tremendous job of being a student athlete um, in high school and college. And and they're continuing to see the success of that, even as they go on to different business endeavors while they're currently playing football. So tell me a little bit about what you loved about playing football. 
the competition is is first and foremost that comes to my mind. Every Sunday you're playing against somebody that is an all pro, um, somebody that you watched when you were growing up in high school and college, or somebody that's younger than you that, you know, is, is starting to make a name for themselves. And you're saying, I want to compete against this person to show how good I am. And then secondly, it's just the camaraderie in the locker room. Um, to be a successful team, you have to have chemistry and you have to get along with the guys in your in your locker room. Maybe not necessarily like you guys are best friends, but there's some chemistry that allows you to communicate effectively on the football field. And I had that um, in Tennessee. There's, there's guys that I have in group chats now that I'm tremendously close with, and it all stems from our time on the football field and in the practice field together and in the locker room on, on uh, those, those years that I played in the NFL. You know, it strikes me that in order to play well together, first and foremost, you need to trust each other, like deeply trust each other. Where does that come from? It comes from a lot of time um, in the meeting rooms and on the practice field and, and knowing that we've ran these plays, we've ran our defensive sets a number of times. And I trust that, you know, my middle linebacker is going to fill the gap that he's supposed to fill so that I don't have to do more than my job. Um, and I can fill the gap that I need to fill. Um, Bill Belichick has a great saying that, you know, just sort of summarizes this and it's called do your job. It's 11 men on the football field doing their individual responsibilities. And when ev all of you do your responsibility to the best of your ability, that play is more likely than not going to be successful for your team. You know, early on in the life of the show, we had a guest whose job, who's, he, he was retired at the point when I spoke to him, but his job was to be the talent scout for coaches for NFL mm -hmm. teams. And I asked him, would you prefer to pick somebody who you know is the most talented person or somebody who is pretty good at a lot of different things? And his well, before I tell you what he said, I want to know what your opinion would be as a teammate. Would you rather play with somebody who has like one radical talent or someone who has who's pretty good at a lot of things? So I, I think the answer is easy for me. And it's somebody who's pretty good at a lot of things. Um, one of the things that was, was stressed by one of my coaches, his name is Jim Schwartz. He was my defensive coordinator in Tennessee, was, was being able to be multidimensional athletes. So having a number of skills and, and subsets of skills that you can rely on and own and strengthen as you continue to work on your craft. And when you have somebody that can do a number of different things well, you'll be able to sort of fill them in in spaces where they're needed rather than somebody that's just exceptional at one thing um, that is not necessarily going to be beneficial to you if you're on a team anywhere else other than doing that one thing. Whereas yeah. if you have a number of different guys that can play a lot of positions well, so to speak, in, in the context of football, then I think it helps you and it makes you more valuable as a team, but also the individuals that have those skill sets they're more valuable to that team. Uh, that's basically exactly what he said. And, uh, and the point he made, the reason why I thought of it when you were talking is because he said, also, if you get somebody who's good at one thing, over time they know they're good at one thing. And it mm -hmm. makes them less good at being part of a team. Whereas mm -hmm. you get somebody who's pretty good at a lot of things, and you hope that they believe that they can get better at all of those things. At all of them. And you things, know correct. that as a result, they can work better with each other. I agree with that completely. Well, so tell me a little bit about sort of how the beginning, middle, and end worked of your career. Like, at what point did you start to say, okay, my time here is limited? I was drafted in the fourth round, which, um, you know, back in, in these days, it was a middle round draft pick. It still is. And it's not promised or guaranteed that you make the team um, initially, because as, as you may not know, at the beginning of the season in training camp, there's 90 players on the team that 90 gets cut down to 53 by week one of the season. And then of those 53, only 45 to 47 play. Um, at least that's how it was in 2005 when I got drafted. Those numbers may be a little bit different now, but back then that was the sort of the breakdown. Um, so every year it was, it was a battle for me, especially not being, you know, quote unquote, a full-time starter. Every year there was, you know, a new draft pick that was a defensive back who could potentially take my spot. Um, every year there's free agents that the team brings in because the object is, we want to make our training camp as competitive as possible so that our team is battle tested when we get into week one. Um, so every year I'm reminded, like, this is not promised. And every year I'm also reminded this could be the year that I no longer have a job, at least in the context of being with Tennessee. So I think maybe my second or third year, I didn't have the greatest training camp. And I mean, stress is an understatement in terms of like whether or not 
I was going to make the team. And you sort of realize that your football mortality is in, in front of you and it could happen on any given play through injury, but also just from, you know, the Tennessee Titans deciding they want to move in another direction. So I think maybe from about my second or third year, I started thinking about what could I potentially do to set up myself, even while I'm still playing, but to set up myself for a career post football. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Also, that sounds so stressful. (laughs) I think um, it is, first and foremost. But I think what you do is you sort of channel that stress during the off season to work as hard as you can so that hopefully training camp can be easy because you you use that as motivation so that when training camp survives, regardless of who is competing with me for my job, I'll play them to the point where it's not even a stressful situation. Yeah, And I was able to do that some years, but some years I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, so tell me about how you made the transition. So I think it all starts with the 2010 slash 2011 NFL lockout, which was essentially the owners of the NFL not necessarily being satisfied with the current status of the collective bargaining agreement. This was a significant moment in recent football history. The league's owners and the players, they couldn't agree on how to divide the more than $9 billion in revenue. For almost 19 weeks in 2011, the NFL was shut down. Players couldn't practice in team facilities or see team doctors or talk to their coaches at all while both sides worked toward an agreement. The NFLPA, the union that represents the players, did a really good job of sort of providing us with notice to say, hey, a lockout is probably going to come, you know, first things first, plan for it, save your money, et cetera. But also know that, you know, during the off season of 2011, you guys won't be in your facilities. You'll have to sort of train somewhere else, et cetera. Um, And it was extremely interesting to me. And what I realized was, you know, I didn't have a a good grasp on the collective bargaining agreement. If you set it down in front of me, it would have looked like a bunch of legalese, which it is, but I don't know how, how much I would have understood it. And I didn't like that because this was something that was affecting my compensation for the upcoming year and ultimately, you know, affecting my career. And I, I just didn't like not having sort of a seat at the table. And I, I felt like if that should ever happen again, I wanted to have a seat at the table and be able to advocate and negotiate for myself. So that really started the transition of not only me preparing for sort of life after football, but also pursuing a career in law. That makes a lot of sense. How, how soon after that did you apply to law school? So I, my last season was 2011. So January 2012, I was a free agent, but I, I thought that I would play um, again in the NFL. And I started law school fall semester of 2014. So it was a two year time frame in which I had to study and take the LSAT. And then also I didn't have anything on my resume at the time, <laughs> if you want to call it what I had a resume at the time. Um, that sort of pointed to a career in law. So I I did a couple of internships. I interned at the NFLPA, as a matter of fact. And then I also did a fellowship um, with Congressman Danny Davis, who represents the district in in Chicago, to sort of put some things in my resume, but also to understand if there was anything that I would want to do within the context of the NFL union or within the context of politics. So I want to just focus on that couple of years a second, because I think there's a lot to learn in that. The how of how you make the pivot feels in retrospect like it makes so much sense. But often when you're doing it, you're just stumbling along, crossing your fingers, hoping you're doing the right thing. Let's start with where you got the advice for what to do. Like, did somebody tell you, hey, you need to go get some internships? So unfortunately, no. But I think that's my fault. Like, it's, it's my fault because I didn't ask the question. And that's something that I would and I do in part on anybody is talk to as many people about what you're, you're planning and what you're attempting to do. W- what happened was I, I sort of went back to Virginia Tech um, the fall semester of 2012. I, again, I told you I had two undergrad degrees. I was essentially six credits short of that second one. Um, and my brothers were playing college football at the time. So I got the opportunity to A, stay in shape and work out at a college campus in case I went back to the NFL. B, finish those required credits in that fall semester, and then C, watch my brothers play football. So I, I took advantage of that. And then the next thing I did was sort of begin to reach out to the NFLPA for a potential internship to, to learn as much as I could because I knew at that point in time that I wanted to pursue law school. The NFLPA is his union, the NFL Players Association. They make tons of resources available to help players once their football careers end. Um, and I, I think I just followed that path. 
But had I talked to, you know, lawyers that I could potentially have reached out for or used on use LinkedIn to, to find people that would have been able to uh, assist me and that I, I probably would have fared a little bit better with respect to, you know, how I chose to study for the LSAT or even the law school that I chose to go to or, you know, thinking whether or not I, I had to apply at that particular time or I could have waited a little bit longer. Yeah. Well, let me also ask you about the financial piece of it. Did you mm-hmm. did you plan for this while you were still playing football? Did you work another job while you while you got ready to go to law school? So so no, and, and that's one thing that football definitely afforded me. It afforded me the financial flexibility to not have to sort of rely on you know outside income. I made a significant in my you know in my estimation living playing football, and I I didn't necessarily spend it during my my playing career. So I was able to um. To, to sort of use the income that I generated then to pay for law school, to work without a, essentially a check for six years between, you know, the time that I started at my current firm in 2017 and when I finished playing in 2011. So that was something that the NFL definitely afforded me. And both the NFL and the NFL Players Union have resources that allowed you to get either tuition reimbursement with the NFLPA or actually pay up to twenty or forty thousand dollars for your continued education through the NFL, which I also took advantage of. We're going to take a quick break here. When we get back, Vincent will tell us how law school has changed him. And we're back. I asked Vincent to reflect on what he thought he would do going into law school and how it changed by the time he got out. I thought that I was going to be a labor and employment lawyer. And then um, intellectual property, fashion law was something that was extremely intriguing for me. For what reason, I I can't remember. But I I pursued that in law school. Um, What ended up happening throughout the course of my law school career is I learned more about what, quote unquote, big law firms do. Like these sort of corporate law firms that represent a lot of these Fortune 500 companies, they pluck what's considered the best talent out of you know these law firms and they give them jobs in various fields, whether it be mergers and acquisitions, finance, capital markets, et cetera, which all of which I had no idea about when I stepped into law school. Um, but it was intriguing because A, you found out that they only select quote unquote the top talent and B, it was a field that I was just tremendously interested in once I started to sort of open the door and peek in and see what was in there. So the, the competitive aspect of saying, hey, I want to be on the scale of what's considered the top talent at my law school, which was a, a Fordham Law School in New York, which is a tremendously competitive law school. And then it was B, um, once I did a summer internship at Freed Frank, which is my, my law firm now, uh, saying, you know, this stuff is really interesting. And the, the players in this, the private equity firms that we work with, the individuals, the corporate boards that we work with are extremely sophisticated, extremely smart. And um, I love what I'm doing. So so that sort of made me transition from, hey, what I thought about or what I thought I knew going into law school to what I currently do now post-law school. And what do you do now post-law school? So I am I am a corporate attorney at, at Freed Frank, Harris, Striver, and Jacobson. It's a Manhattan-based law firm. And I work in our corporate group. Uh, we do mergers and acquisitions for, like I said, public and private companies. And we also represent a number of premier private equity firms. And we do a lot of their, you know, dispositions and acquisitions of companies and also purchases of minority stakes in, in private or public businesses. So it's a lot of fun. And I continue to learn on an everyday basis. And that's the thing that I think really you know entices me about this job the hours are <laughs> a lot but um yep. you're, you're never not learning and you're always continuing to see your skills become you know better which sort of transitions to football i think that's another sort of parallel between you know what i do now and what i did back then is i see the growth in myself and i enjoy you know continuing to see me grow so i think i like that vincent it's not lost on me that you when i asked you what you loved about football the very first thing you said was being competitive, like being mm-hmm. in a competitive field and knowing that I can compete. It also sounds like that's what you loved about law school. And perhaps now that's what you love about your profession. It's it's amazing how like that similarity can can move through so many different fields. I think so. And it's not lost on me that I said that also. A lot of people probably thrive on that competition. Um, but, you know, sometimes you use it to push you. And I think I do a really, a really good job of sort of using that to push me to be the best me that I can be, whether that be, you know, through small habits that I do every day to get better, or, you know, whether that be just to make sure that I prepare myself to do the best job that I can on an everyday basis. It's, it's sort of that competition to make sure that, 
whenever I need to perform, I can perform to the best of my ability. Do you think that most people in your day-to-day life now know that you were an NFL player? I would say most probably don't. Um, It's not something that I broadcast. It very rarely comes up in my day-to-day work. I think a lot of the associates and partners that I work with obviously do know because I've been at the firm now for five years. Um, It's something that comes up in in general conversations. Of course, I'm the go-to person for any fantasy football questions or, um, (laughs) you know, just just thoughts and ideas about how a football season is going. Uh, But from like a client perspective, I, I don't know how many of them know which is fine. It's not something that I, I feel like validates who I am. Um, I, I played football. I, I wasn't a football player. And I, I like that um, because I, I still get the chance to enjoy it on an everyday basis when I have conversations with my brothers and, and we talk about you know football all the time. Yeah. You know, so much of, as, as I mentioned, the season is, is focused on reinvention stories, talking to people mm-hmm. who made huge shifts from one complete field to another field. And the theme that comes up all over and over again is that life kind of sells you on this idea that you need to be one thing. You need to be a football player or or you need to be a lawyer. But the Mm -hmm. truth is that humans are multidimensional in our passions and our interests, and we have room to be a lot of different things. And I'm I'm just curious where your love of sports falls into your life now. So outside of my family and in work, I think it's it's definitely third. Um, and, and by sports, I'm including football, but also other sports. I am a avid golfer. <laughs> and I think that's a competition thing also because, you know, oh. I'm not really good. And you're competing against yourself in the golf course to get better, obviously. But yeah. um, so I, I think it would go, you know, first and foremost is, is, is God. I should say that um, being a Christian myself um, and then my family and then my career, my professional career. Uh, and then sports. And I, I think a big reason for that would be because I, I have, like you said, three younger brothers. All three are still involved with the NFL. Corey is a, a scout with the Carolina Panthers. Kyle just finished his, I think, eighth season now, my goodness, um, wow. in which he played with the Denver Broncos. And then Kendall just finished his fifth playing with the Washington football team. So, like I said, we, we talk every week about football. I watch it. I, I watch their games specifically. If, if they're not playing, I typically don't watch football on a Sunday. But um, I still follow college football and things of that nature. So it's still a big part. But um, and as you mentioned, I um, I am in fact aware that we are multidimensional and it does not define me. I, I think the biggest thing that sort of helped me make that transition from being you know a professional in one field and then coming down all the way to the bottom of another one is just like the complete lack of ego. And I think that sort of hinders a lot of people when they're successful in one field from, you know, going to another field and making a transition to have to take orders or be taught or have a mentor or have mentors when you at one point in time were the mentor or the advisor. And sort of making that transition is hard. It's difficult. It's something that I think a lot of, you know, my fellow professional athletes sort of struggle with once they finish their playing careers. You know, I was making this amount of money you know, as an athlete, and the only opportunity that I have for what I'm interested in is making significantly less. And I don't necessarily know if I want to do that. And that's something that I even probably struggled with. But I, I think one thing that was helpful was that I didn't attach sort of my ego to that of being a professional athlete. It was, you know, what can I do and who do I need to talk to to become a better lawyer? And I never sort of thought that was an issue. And I think that really helped me during the, the path or the process of going from playing football to law school and now to being a you know a practicing attorney. That's such a good point, Vincent, because I think no matter what you do, if you if you rise to a point of seniority in your field, you get to be the one to call the shots. You probably mm-hmm. make the most money. You get mm-hmm. to you get to know what to do. Yep. And to make a change, you need to figure out how to be a beginner again. And you can mm-hmm. want to do that, but it's a mindset. And yep. it's hard. It's really it hard. It's very hard. And yep. uh, I just wanted to sort of impart my philosophy on that to, to let people know that it's not something that you should struggle with. Whatever dream that you have, just go and pursue it to the best of your ability. That was Vincent Fuller. He's an associate with the law firm Freed Frank. And this week on Office Hours, we're going to talk about mentors, teachers, the people who help you figure out how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Vincent had some important ones. He talked about his coach and about the NFL Players Association and about his family. So who's influenced you? Join us for Office Hours on Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. It's our coffee break, (laughs) quite literally. The Hello Monday team pours out a cup and sits down for a chat. 
You can find us on the LinkedIn news page or email us for a link at hellomonday at linkedin.com. And as always, if you like the show, please rate and review us. It helps us so much. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show was produced by Sarah Storm with help from Taisha Henry, Michelle O'Brien, and Derek Carl. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florencia Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor are team players. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. I'm Jesse Hempel. We're back next Monday. Thanks for listening. <laughs>